Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Best Practices for Spine Surgery Using a Motorized Hinge Table, sponsored by Mizuho OSI. I am Margo Vaselli with Becker's Healthcare. Before we begin the presentation today, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand following today's event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Today we are joined by the SPINE team from the University of Minnesota. You will hear from Dr. David Polly, Dr. Christopher Martin, Dr. Kristen Jones, and Dr. Jonathan Sembrano. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to the Chief of SPINE Service, Dr. David Polly, to start today's presentation. Hello. I'm Dr. David Polly, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk about optimizing sagittal contour alignment using table-based strategies. Uh, I'm going to provide an introductory talk, and then my partners, Dr. Chris Martin, Kristen Jones, and Jonathan Sembrano, will give uh, specific focused talks on this topic as well. I look forward to sharing this information with you, and the opinions contained herein are my own opinions. So I started this topic as an unregenerate segmental sagittal contour fanatic. After visiting Jurgen Harms in the mid-1990s and seeing T-Lift, I went back to the hotel that evening and tried to draw up each of the steps that were necessary to figure out how this procedure actually worked. So it's a variation on the classic cliff as described by Ralph Cloward so many years ago, uh, where we find a way into the inner body space, clean it out, and then adequately graft it to get it to heal. And the classic PLIF involved significant side-to-side -side retraction, which resulted in significant scarring, probably more dural tears, and the challenge of arachnoiditis. The TLIF then, uh, what I initially called it, was a unilateral, far-lateral PLIF. And the concept was that you took out the facet joint and then worked through that area with less retraction required. And that uh, I spent a long time trying to get a good picture in the anatomy lab of what this working zone looked like, and this is what it is. Uh, and as we came to understand this concept better, we really understood the structures at risk, what the working zone is, where the dorsal root ganglion is, and what we needed to do to get access into the disc space. And by increasing kyphosis, we can open up the disc space posteriorly which um, allows us to get better access to clean it out and to insert larger implants in. And that you can sometimes retract the dorsal root ganglion, but the less you do that, probably the better. So the concept of inducing kyphosis across the segment to open up the working channel is a key concept that has facilitated doing this operation well. The other thing that we've learned is that uh, good resection of the facet joint allows you a better working channel as well. And there's always this posterior superior corner of the vertebra that when we take that down, that that increases the working zone by a millimeter or two as well. So again, we're always looking for ways to increase that working zone to allow us better access to the disc space and to allow uh, insertion of a larger vertebral body. The challenge is that when you use the screws to distract, that you can plow the screws badly. Uh, that happened to me in an osteoporotic patient and fracturing out the pedicle made it a challenging salvage uh, to try to accomplish it. And that launched the investigation about how can we induce this hypothesis without using screw-based distraction, or at least as much. And so the TLIF surgical technique, as, as we focused on it in the 1990s, was to open this disc space up, clean it out, uh, decorticate, put in a structural inner body support and bone graft material, and then to restore the lordosis. And so the question then is, how can we do this better without stressing the screws? So this began an effort that started with the use of a uh, Crank Wilson frame. And so this was the Wilson frame that I started using on the uh, original OSI carbon fiber frame table, and that we would crank it up to induce a kyphosis and then crank it down to enhance the lordosis, but you didn't really get true lordosis. You got segmental change, but you didn't get um, a profound lordosis. And so uh, my 
colleagues and friends at Walter Reed, uh, Mike Rosner and then Mario Cardoza studied this and showed that they were in fact able to change the intervertebral angle by uh, about four or five degrees by doing this Wilson frame maneuver. And so this is from their publication uh, and their work at Walter Reed looking at the uh, OR table and the Wilson frame utilization for doing this. So what about using TILA for deformity correction? Well, there's been a lot of debate about it and that I, I'm pretty convinced that TILA can increase lordosis, especially when combined with a Smith-Peterson osteotomy and it allows for significant sagittal plane improvement from a posterior only approach. So here's a patient presented to me after a fusion many years before uh, for a fracture and that uh, this was a T-lift done probably 15 years ago now, but you can see it was uh, with a uh, resorbable cage and so that's why you don't see a structural interbody there. Uh, but you can see that significant lordosis was achieved. Today we might uh, approach this case differently but the concept of getting that enhanced lordosis through the use of a bilateral facetectomy or Smith-Peterson osteotomy Schwab grade two uh, will allow us to get that sagittal contour change as you see here. A another example, similar kind of problem, similar kind of strategy. And so Sharon Eason uh, looked up the results from our group looking at this change and we were able to demonstrate significant uh, contour uh, improvement through the use of this uh, bilateral T-lift and at the time we were using a table to help uh, enhance our change. And so this is the concept of what's now being called the deformity T-lift of putting a structural inner body support in and then uh, doing the bilateral facetectomies or Smith-Peters and osteotomy to generate the angular realignment. So as we looked at this, the, it, this began a discussion that I had with Steve Lamb probably over almost a decade of saying, you know, you got a table that's good, but maybe it could be better and maybe it could help us uh, distract and compress without having to use the pedicle screws to uh, do the distraction and compression. So uh, the engineers at Mizuho came up with a motorized hinged carbon frame table uh, sounds like it was a challenging engineering feat to get it done, uh, but they did. And then we started to try to figure out how to use this to optimize the sagittal contour of our patients. And so the remainder of the presentations will look at the use of the motorized hinge table in the T-lift and pedicle subtraction osteotomies. So I'd like to thank you for your attention this morning. And I'd like to turn the presentation over now to my partner, Dr. Chris Martin, who's going to talk specifically about using the motorized hinge table in the T-lift procedure. Well, good morning or evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Um, I'm Dr. Christopher Martin. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And uh, thank you to Dr. Polly for the introduction to this topic. Uh, my portion of the talk today is on the deformity T-lift, which is a technique we've been doing in our institution involving bilateral facetectomy, uh, resulting in a Smith-Peterson osteotomy, and then subsequent bilateral inner body fusion and osteotomy closure with a hinged motorized operative table. Uh, this is our authorship group and all the other authors are involved in this webinar. Uh, we do have some disclosures. Uh, Mine are on the uh, right side of your screen. Uh, the other authors will also provide additional disclosures during their talk. I think the uh, key disclosure is that uh, Mizuho, which is the uh, company that produces the hinged motorized operative table, has provided some research support to our institution, although none to me personally. So a little bit of background on this topic. Uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been increasing emphasis on sagittal alignment at the time of instrumented spine fusions. And the majority of the early data and studies looked at global malalignment, particularly sagittal malalignment, and showed strong correlation between patient reported health outcome scores and quality of life and global measures of sagittal malalignment. So I think that's well accepted data. However, there remained some debate in the field about the importance of sagittal alignment in short segment constructs, 
And I think in recent years, even that debate has become more and more settled science. Specifically, we know that short segment kyphosis increases the adjacent segment strain because the supra-adjacent segment has to hyperextend in order to compensate for a kyphotic segment below. And while that hyperextension may compensate for a short time, it increases the facet joint contact stresses and eventually results in degenerative changes that uh, increase the risk of adjacent segment disease and uh, need for additional surgeries. So as a result of this, I think in recent years, it's not just long fusions where sagittal alignment is being emphasized. It's being emphasized even in short segment constructs. And for our talk today, the significance of that is that TLIF, which is the most commonly performed posterior inner body fusion, TLIF in the literature is historically at best a neutral or in some cases a kyphosis producing surgery. Uh, mo most TLIFs are performed with a unilateral fac uh, facetectomy. And what I want to talk to you about today is what at our institution we found is the best way to help TLIF be a lordosis producing surgery rather than a neutral or kyphogenic procedure. Uh, here's an, a case example, um, something I'm sure all of you have seen in your clinics. A 78 year old male with claudicatory back and radicular leg pain. He's got significant spondylosis at 5-1, uh, grade 1 spondy at 4-5 and there's both lateral recess and for animal stenosis at both levels. Uh, when we look at his images, uh, I, I didn't include a ending scoliosis film, but you get the sense from this lateral lumbar radiograph that there doesn't seem to be global sagittal malalignment. However, there is clearly some regional malalignment, specifically a regional lordosis has been lost as a result of these inverted. So I think what you don't want to do is fuse this in situ. And if you do that, the likelihood is that over time, this hyperextension at L34 will significantly increase the facet joint contact stress, lead to 3-4 degenerative changes, and you'll really increase your risk of adjacent segment disease if you fuse this in situ. So therefore, the surgical plan should address the regional malalignment. And the surgical plan that I proposed for this patient was an all-posterior procedure with T-lift between L4 and S1. And use a motorized hinged operative table to assist with osteotomy closure. Uh, this is the the case, we will position the patient with the table in flexion, which is kind of how it's shown on your screen now. The uh, flexion position mimics a Wilson frame and helps to open up the posterior elements and makes the disc space access a little bit easier. The only time I don't use flexion is if the patient has significant abdominal obesity. Uh, flexing the table does uh, place increased pressure on the abdomen, particularly if it's draped here below the table. And uh, if you're flexing the table in an obese patient, that increased abdominal pressure will really significantly increase the venous pressure in the paraspinal muscles and in the epidural space and increase your bleeding. So for my obese patients, I tend not to flex the table, but uh, if you have a thinner patient and you can flex, it's certainly an advantage. Uh, we do a standard exposure. Uh, my personal preference is to expose out to the tips of the transverse processes. Um, and then we place the screws prior to any of the intracanal or intradiscal work. So if you prefer to do intertransverse grafting, either with crest graft or some type of donor material, 
the, I, I recommend that that grafting be done prior to screw placement, so just after exposure. Uh, the reason is that after the screws go in, it's very difficult to see the intertransverse space. Um, and you might wonder why do such a wide exposure? Well, at our institution, we place the instrumentation using navigation assistance. And I found that it's a very important safety check to have the anatomy visible when you're using navigation. So if you have the anatomy visible, you can verify that what you're seeing intraoperatively correlates with the image on the navigation screen. So I'll make a start point with a burr and then place a navigated all on that start point. And I want the start point that I've chosen on the visible anatomy to match what is shown on the screen. And that's how I help make sure that the navigation is accurate for every screw that is placed. Um, in order to bring the O-arm in and assist with that instrumentation placement, you have to bring the table into a head-up reverse Trendelenburg position. Uh, the reason is that the widest part of the O-arm is the equator. And if you leave the head down, the arm boards tend to bang into the side of the O-arm. Uh, if you just use table up and try to raise up the whole table, then the patient's legs and lower lumbar region end up being very, very high in the air and it's, it's very difficult to work around. So we found that the head up position helps get the arm boards out of the way and into the equator of the O-arm, but it leaves the uh, lower lumbar region down low enough that you can actually work on it. So once you've completed the exposure and grafting of the inner transfer space, if you choose to do that, and then you've placed your screws, it's time to start the inner body and osteotomy portion of the procedure. And we do a bilateral facetectomy using standard techniques, typically an osteotome to take down the inferior articular process, and then curettes to split the ligamentum flavum, and a combination of wide mouth rongeur and kerosene to remove the superior articular process. Now, this is done bilaterally, and the ligament of flavum is released in the midline to reduce any remaining soft tissue connection between the two vertebral segments. After the osteotomy is complete, we typically insert a lamina spreader to distract the inner space, and this is quite a powerful technique. It uh, substantially widens the disc space, it makes the visualization much, much easier, uh, and it also increases, it introduces a margin of safety because it uh, produces some space between the cephalad nerve root and the caudal pedicle. So that triangle uh, that we're all used to working through gets wider with the distraction and uh, makes it a little bit easier and safer to get into the disc. Uh, we do a bilateral discectomy uh, on both sides with a very thorough removal of disc material. Uh, the turn and rotate distractors are very helpful with this. They also, in addition to the lamina spreader, help to widen the disc space. Uh, they help to remove some of the disc material off the end plate, and they're quite powerful in achieving distraction. Uh, you'll over just level was uh, totally lapsed. These uh, turn and rotate distractors, it's really opened up quite nicely, and there's no end plate violation. Uh, we've also studied the amount of disc that can be removed with this technique, and at our institution, the volume of disc removed is equivalent to the amount of disc removed with an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. So it's really quite a thorough discectomy when you do it bilaterally. After you've done your discectomy, it's time to trial, and I want to—I'm sure you're all familiar with the trialing process, but I just wanted to emphasize the importance of doing the trialing with the lamina spreader removed because this is such a powerful uh, distraction technique, it's very, very easy to overstuff the disc space. And you don't wanna do that in a short segment construct. Uh, particularly patients, because if you overstuff it, you'll get subsidence and risk non-union. Uh, we do use fluor uh, fluoroscopic images to position the cages. And what you want is to really get those cages as far anterior in the disc space as possible. Uh, you don't want to puncture the anterior longitudinal ligament and risk losing the cage. Uh, 
but you want it to be right at the front of the disc space so that when you go to close your osteotomy, there's space and room to hinge over the cage and close down the posterior elements. Now, here's an example of why you do not want to overstuff the disc. Uh, intraoperative image on the left. Uh, this was a fairly large cage for this patient, but there's no obvious end plate violation intraoperatively. I think, you know, the intraoperative images certainly look very good, uh, other than noting it's a little bit overstuffed. And then unfortunately, here at a year post-op, you can see that the cage has settled into the end plates and it's gone on to non-union. And I think this type of result is much more likely if you put in too big of a cage. So it's really important when you're trialing to take the lamina spreader out and choose a height of cage that produces appropriate tension within the disc, but that does not overstuff it, particularly in osteoporotic patients. Once you've placed your cage, it's time to close down the osteotomy. And certainly it is possible to close it down with a compressor or uh, some other local technique. But we found that using the hinged operative table is a very nice way to do this. Uh, here's an example of what the table does uh, going into extension. And you can follow the extension on serial fluoroscopic images. So typically I go into the surgery with a goal amount of lordosis in mind. And I'll take the table through five degree incremental changes and take serial fluoroscopic images until we've achieved the appropriate amount of lordosis correction. Uh, the uh, table positioning does correlate with the amount of lordosis change that you see intraoperatively. Um, you know, here's our initial image when the patient was flexed to allow disc space access. And as we go through five degree changes with serial fluoroscopic images, there's a 20 degree change in table position and about a 12 degree change in the bony uh, alignment. So that roughly correlates with what we've seen, which is that the intraoperative changes in the segmental alignment of the vertebra are about a half of what the range of motion that the table goes through. So in other words, for every 10 degrees of table extension, you might expect about five degrees of increase in the patient's uh, vertebral lordosis correction. Uh, so here's the pre and uh, post-op images. If I'm gonna be critical of myself, this L4-5 cage could have been uh, more anterior in the disc, but I do think that we achieved the regional lordosis goals. Uh, there's less pelvic retroversion and less hyperextension of that L3-4 disc. Uh, here's his AP and lateral images. So in summary, the segmental lordosis for this particular case went from 15 degrees pre-op to 42 post-op. So it was a 27 degree change, um, which I think is certainly more than you would expect from a unilateral T-lift based on the available literature, which again would show typically a neutral or kyphogenic procedure. You know, with bilateral osteotomy, uh, bilateral facetectomy and osteotomy closure, it's really possible to get quite a bit of additional lordosis correction. And then we found that the hinge motorized operative table is a useful tool for controlling that correction and really dialing in the amount of lordosis that is achieved. So I hope this uh, webinar was useful. Um, after this, my partner, Dr. Jones, is going to give an additional talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for that excellent presentation. Thank you for joining us today. And now I'm going to be speaking about the use of the flexible hinged motorized operative table for spinal deformity techniques. And specifically, we'll be covering uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy and the utility of this table in controlled closure. And just some background, the authors here and our disclosures. Key disclosure being that we have received research support for our institution from Mizuho, the manufacturer of the table that I'll be speaking about. As a background, as all of us are well aware, pedicle subtraction osteotomy is routinely employed in rigid sagittal spinal deformities or coronal spinal deformities that are rigid. 
And it's an inherently destabilizing part of the operation in the sense that we're disarticulating all three columns of the spine. In order to close the osteotomy to obtain our desired correction, the more traditional ways of doing this have been with cantilever forces involving direct forces on the implants themselves and now in modern era pedicle screws, and a significant amount of compressive force is often employed in order to fully close the osteotomy. While this is certainly effective, it also leads to strain at the implant interface. And three column osteotomies are plagued by high instances of pseudoarthrosis and rod breakage as is. So theoretically applying more force at the implant interface could raise your risk of those complications. Today I'm going to be discussing letting the table do some work for you rather than stressing your implants. And we're going to talk about closing the, osteo the osteotomy site at a PSO using this flexible hinged table. So these are pictures of the actual table itself with one of our volunteers. And this is the Mizuho Pro Axis table by name. And this table on the left picture here demonstrates flexion, which of course is very useful for interlaminar exposure, but of course you would not want to fuse a patient in sagittal alignment and flexion. Therefore, we use the table's movement in surgery to move the table into extension and allow us to obtain our desired alignment. And as my colleagues are demonstrating with T-lift procedures, I'll be doing similarly with the pedicle subtraction osteotomy procedure. Before we talk specifically about the PSO closure technique, I'd just like to point out several pearls. And the first is that you really want to place the hip pad as close as possible to the operative table's hinge site. That specific hinge site in the picture on the left is demarcated with a star. And the reason that this is important is that this allows you to maximize the angular change that you get. The second thing I'd like to point out is that after moving the table through a large range of motion, or even a slight range of motion, we recommend that the patient's face, head, neck position, and their arm position be checked by the anesthesiologist on the other end of the drapes. And the reason for that is because as you change the position of the table, sometimes the body weight of the patient will cause them to shift slightly. And you wanna be sure that you haven't induced a new point of pressure that previously wasn't there in the table's previous position. One thing that's very helpful in this for your anesthesia team is that there is a mirrored face plate that fits on the table itself in which the head cradle rests. And that mirror allows a reflection of the patient's face to be easily accessible to the anesthesia team trying to check that. All right, so moving into our case example of the PSO, this is a 68 year old gentleman previously undergoing an L2 to S1 fusion at an outside hospital and then unfortunately suffering a sacral fracture. And the combination of the fusion alignment and the sacral fracture have left him in pretty significant sagittal malalignment. You can see that he's employing about 33 degrees of pelvic retroversion and also hyperextending through his thoracic spine in order to compensate for his pelvic incidence to lumbar lordosis mismatch here. His pelvic incidence is approximately 79 degrees and again his lumbar lordosis is about 37 degrees here. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the patient initially, he developed a solid three column fusion from L2 to S1. And therefore we're left with needing a three column osteotomy in order to correct his alignment. Our plan therefore was revision with a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at L4. Initially, we positioned the patient with the table in flexion, although recognizing that this patient being rigidly fused is not going to have an opening of the interlaminar space at the desired levels. Uh, in this case, but in cases where there are mobile levels, certainly that assists. We placed the table in flexion because it does help us maximize osteotomy closure with a larger range of table. So here we revised the implants, we placed pelvic fixation, and of note so that the x-rays at the end are more easily interpretable, we use dual headed screws above and below the PSO level in order to accommodate a four rod construct without the need for any accessory um, things to tie in the rods. So again, we plan our wedge based on our desired degree of correction and here somewhere around 35, 40 degrees. So we plan that wedge and then we employ the standard PSO technique. So we resect the fusion mass, review, remove all dorsal bony elements. We're resecting the pedicles flush with the vertebral body. We're transecting the transverse processes. We typically leave them in situ to serve as a bone graft. We then dissect the lateral vertebral body wall and we use our osteotome to create a wedge for a pedicle subtraction osteotomy in our desired contour.
We then, as a final step prior to osteotomy closure, employ a posterior wall impactor to impact the bone that's closest to the ventral dura away from the fecal sac. And it's at this time that we typically see the osteotomy start to close on its own. I'd like to point out that although the slides that I'll be showing you do not show a stabilizing rod in situ, that's because we're working at a lumbar level with a much lower risk of sudden neurologic injury if we were to have some more quick collapsing of the osteotomy site. We absolutely recommend using a stabilizing rod in levels of three column osteotomies in the thoracic spine or in the cervical spine. In the lumbar spine, we have gotten away from using it because this is such a controlled technique for closure, but certainly there's absolutely no reason that you can't put a stabilizing rod in. It just prevents you from working on both sides simultaneously, but it gives you the added benefit of even more uh, safety and stabilization. So here we're gonna show some slides about initially when the PSO is performed and then with sequential extension of the table to close the osteotomy. So although we did perform this typically in five degree increments intraoperatively, I'm just going to show you several pictures so that we don't have to go the entire range through. What you'll notice is very often as you begin the table range of closure that you do not see a one-to-one -one correlation between a one degree angular change in the table and a one degree angular change on your osteotomy site. And you shouldn't expect that. There often is an accelerated closure near the end of range of osteotomy. Uh, whereas the beginning of the osteotomy sometimes has a delayed closure relative to the actual table itself. So here, prior to the pedicle subtraction osteotomy at the picture on the left, we're measuring lordotic angulation from L3 to L5 across this L4 PSO site to be about 36 degrees. And when we perform the PSO and we do resect that last bit of bone just ventral to the dura, then we take this picture and see that just because of our PSO without closure, we're now at 46 degrees across that same segment, so a 10 degree change with no table change. And now we're going to begin the pictures of the table extension. And again, you'll notice the profound change. The table starts at 20 degrees of flexion, and as we move it through its range to about zero degrees of, of table angulation, so a flat table, you can see that we've closed the pedicle subtraction osteotomy already, and now it's at 56 degrees. And again, this is not, no compressive forces on the screws whatsoever. We do the table change in five degree increments to avoid a sudden change which could induce a rapid osteotomy closure. So we do recommend pausing after five degree increments and certainly in the beginning of your experience to take fluoroscopy shots at each of those intervals until you get used to the table technique. Moving forward, again, this is the same picture we left the last slide with, where the angular relationship of L3 to L5 is 56 degrees of lordosis. And now we move the table through a further 10 degrees of extension, and we see that our pedicle subtraction osteotomy has closed at about 66 degrees. And this is in our, our planned range of correction, meaning we actually don't need to compress at all across the implants. We've achieved our desired angular correction for the patient's lordosis. So again, summarizing that, we were able to correct this patient's pelvic incidence to lumbar lordosis mismatch with this pedicle subtraction osteotomy with a very large angular deformity change without ever compressing across our implants and using a very slow and controlled closure mechanism via remote control with the table. Our anesthesia team controls the remote control and prior to surgery, we briefly instruct them about what we'll be asking at the time of osteotomy closure. And after a few times, our team became very used to this, and this is just a very routine part of surgery now. But certainly, again, just to emphasize, we recommend closing in slow increments at first, no more than five degrees at a time, with fluoroscopy shots to ensure there's no unanticipated translation uh, or rapid changes, in addition to direct visualization in the operative field. And as a final point, just to reemphasize, we do recommend using a stabilizing rod if a three-column osteotomy is being performed at a level where spinal cord is present. Finally, here on the right, you can see the patient's post-operative imaging. And again, a CT scan post-operatively demonstrating that we've restored about 72 degrees of lumbar lordosis. So that's a, a very nice demonstration of how powerful this technique can be without actually needing any compressive forces on the pedicle screws or, or rods whatsoever.
So in conclusion, using this table allows for a controlled closure of your pedicle subtraction osteotomy site. And while certainly you can close a PSO with a lot of different maneuvers and you don't need a motorized table to do so, we have found that using the table allows for a very predictable, slow correction without any implant force, which certainly is, a, in our view, helps us reduce the risk of implant loosening over time. Just to reemphasize, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between table angular change and the degree of osteotomy closure. So you need to observe carefully the osteotomy closure that you are getting. And finally, without a meticulous osteotomy technique, the table is not going to achieve your desired correction for you if you haven't properly uh, created the three-column osteotomy. So we don't advocate any closure of the table if there still is obvious stiff bone in place because the table couldn't be expected to move a level that still has not uh, been completely disarticulated through three columns. And finally, just to reemphasize the point, anytime the table angular change is employed, we do recommend having the anesthesia team reevaluate the patient's head, neck, face position, as well as the arm position to ensure that the table angle change hasn't induced any pressure points on any of the patient's extremities, head or neck. Thank you very much. And next we'll be hearing from Dr. Sombrano. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, hello, every, everybody. My name is Jonathan Sombrano. Uh, so earlier you heard about using the hinge table uh, for one or two level fusions, and then later for pedicle subtraction osteotomies. So now we're gonna be talking about using this table for multi-level inner body fusion with Smith-Peterson osteotomy for uh, multi-level pathology or deformity. So these are my disclosures. And as mentioned earlier, the key disclosure is that we are conducting research at our site uh, on this table uh, that is sponsored by the makers of, of, of the hinge table, uh, Mizuho. So as a background, so earlier you heard about this presentation. Uh, we have been using this table for one or two level lumbar fusions. However, multi-level pathology and more severe deformity may require longer fusion constructs. Multi-level inner body fusion with Smith-Peterson osteotomies may be an alternative to three-column osteotomy for sagittal deformity correction. And a use of a motorized hinge table may help facilitate and fine-tune that correction. So here's our case, uh, our representative case. Uh, this is a 71-year-old male who had a uh, previous minimally invasive T-lift at a single level, L45, and now presents with severe sagittal deformity, multi-level lumbar stenosis from L1 to sacrum. And you could see that uh, he has a very flat back. Uh, lumbar lordosis measures 25 degrees. I calculated uh, ideally should be 54 degrees. And lower lumbar lordosis specifically is very low as well. 15 degrees, ideal 36. And he, the thoracolumbar region is relatively straight, so there's no significant deformity up there. Uh, he is trying to re retrovert, but you can see it's not really retroverted. The uh, pelvic tilt is only 18 degrees. Um, and you, you notice that the uh, femur uh, are uh, flexed here. So he probably just really has very limited um, hip extension. That's why the pelvis is not as retroverted as you might expect. Um, and the sagittal vertical axis shows positive imbalance. So the surgical plan is for multi-level inner body fusion and cage placement uh, from L1 down to the sacrum. So I decided to perform a lateral approach at the upper lumbar levels from L1 to L4, and then turn the patient over prone, perform a T-lift at L5-S1, and with a, and put in pedicle screws with bilateral pelvic fixation. I decided to do Smith-Peterson osteotomies only at L5-S1 and L3-4. Uh, as you know, L4-5 is already solidly fused, so we cannot get much motion there. Um, and I decided to spare L1 to an L3, and I'll, L1 to an L2-3, and I'll explain to you why later. We then use the hinge table to facilitate controlled osteotomy closure and regional lordosis correction. So these are images from the part from part one, the lateral inner body fusion. We place three cages from L1 to L4, 
that uh, went very smoothly. We then turned the patient over prone. Uh, we placed, so uh, during this uh, procedure, we started out by flexing the table 10 degrees, and this facilitates exposure, screw placement, decompression, and intradiscal work. We then placed screws at the L1 to pelvis and performed a T-lift with smith peters and osteotomy at L5S1. That means bilateral facetectomies, bilateral discectomies, bilateral cage placement. And we used 18 degree lordotic cages for this. I then performed a, an additional smith peters and osteotomy at L3-4. So uh, as you can see in this uh, slide, uh, table flexion maximizes disc access. So this was more or less the position that the patient was at when we were doing all this work. However, prior to rod placement, we extended the table. Um, so how, how did we achieve deformity correction? Well, first, uh, as, you could, uh, as you know, the osteotomies and the disc prep provided segmental release. So that loosens up the uh, segment, allowing movement and allowing correction. The cages provided anterior column lengthening and also acted as pivot point uh, for the correction. And as I said earlier, I did not perform Smith-Peterson osteotomies at the upper levels, L1, 2, and L2, 3. And that is to avoid upper lumbar overcorrection. So we're now talking about lumbar lordosis distribution or redistribution. Um, and I also did something else. I placed a provisional rod from L1 to L4 to lock the alignment at these levels prior to extending the table gradually. So from 10 degrees flexion, I, I went down in five degree arc, uh, five degree increment and made measurements. And I stopped at, five, at uh, zero or neutral, which is a 10 degree arc because that is when I deemed that the correction was already sufficient. Um, and then we place the, uh, the final rod. So as you can see in this picture, extending the table helps uh, restore the lumbar lordosis or that lordotic arch. And you are able to do that without stressing the screws, unlike if you are using the rods and and trying to uh, manipulate the spine and putting a lot of stress on the screws and risking pull out of those screws. So here is the uh, preoperative and uh, postoperative uh, picture side by side. And I apologize, we haven't yet gotten uh, a, a better quality picture. Um, this case was only done a month ago, and uh, you know, so so we're still waiting to to get uh, better um, full spine X-rays. But you can see the measurements. Uh, in the pelvic incidence, I mean, you see a difference of two degrees, which could simply be measurement error. But the lumbar lordosis, as you could see, increased by 30 degrees. Um, at the lower lumbar lordosis, L4 to S1, likewise increased 14 degrees. Um, and, you know, pelvic tilt, it, it's, uh, it's now almost uh, aniverted. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, it is uh, early on, and so this may not be representative yet of how the patient would finally be standing. Um, and then uh, the sagittal vertical axis also decreased somewhat. All right, so first, uh, you, you, you might be wondering, you know, why did I, you know, how, how did I come up with the ideal values? Well, you know, obviously we, we need to define a target. Uh, that, that is one thing that I have learned. Uh, yeah, you know, if you don't if you don't have a target, then really, what are you shooting at? And so, you know, preoperatively, I, I tried to identify you know a target. And this uh, article uh, from 2019, uh, you know, from the group from France, um, shows us these formulas. And yeah, this is not really a big departure from what we've been taught. You know, the the Schwab classification tells us that uh, ideal lumbar lordosis is based on PI, although the assumption there is it's a one-to-one -one correlation and you have to be within 10 degrees of pelvic incidence. But we know that that's too simplistic. And so this uh, formula, ideal LL is equal to 0 0.5 PI plus 28, is still based on pelvic incidence, but it's not a one-to-one -one correlation 
and basically as the uh, you know uh, pelvic incidence you know goes away from the midpoint of around 56 degrees then lumbar lordosis should move in the same direction but at like half the rate um, and then it's important to make sure that two-thirds of your lordosis is at the bottom l4 to s1 and that has been shown in multiple uh, previous studies as well so it is very important to avoid overcorrection. Uh, we, we, you know, I, I think many of us have learned this the hard way that, um, you know, it, it's not about how much lordosis you could you could get. Uh, you know, in the past we we take pride in saying that oh I should get this much lordosis or that much lordosis, but but really it, it's about hitting your target. Um, and if you overcorrect, that's just as bad because then it leads to proximal junctional problems like in, in this particular patient. And so uh, what, what are the steps we, we, we uh, employ to, to make sure we hit the right target? Well, there's, um, there are many factors that uh, affect lur you know, lordosis. And one is the, your cage, um, you know, cage lordosis, cage height, cage length. Um, and obviously, you know, at the bottom levels, they could use more lordotic cages. As I said, I, I used an 18 degree, lordotic, uh, 18 degree lordotic cages for this uh, patient at L5S1. Um, and when doing a, you know, a T-lift, uh, doing it from behind, uh, I, I, I use shorter cages uh, if I want uh, more um, lordosis. Um, and if I am trying to limit lordosis, then I use longer cages so that the back part or, or the butt of the cage um, prevents uh, closure um, posteriorly at that level. Uh, cage position, as you know, is very important as well. Um, if you place your cage more anteriorly, then it uh, creates more lordosis. If you place it more posteriorly, then it limits the posterior closure. Um, and then use of osteotomy. Uh, as you heard earlier, we uh, do a lot of Smith-Peterson osteotomies or, or posterior column osteotomies um, to, to help loosen up that level. And then it, unless necessary, unless you're trying to get lordosis at the upper lumbar levels, maybe you should avoid uh, Smith-Peterson osteotomies at those levels. And then as I showed, uh, you know, placing a provisional rod at the upper levels prior to extending the table kind of uh, forces the, you know, the, the closure to, or the uh, correction to happen at the lower levels uh, because you've already lost the upper levels. So that makes you know, allows you to kind of choose, uh, select where the correction will happen. Um, and sometimes when you do these, uh, you know, T lifts, um, you know, you notice that the spine is already stacked down into hyperlordosis when you take an image. And so if if you've already overshot the mark, then obviously there's no need to extend the bed any further. In fact, you may even consider flexing the bed more. Although usually, uh, you know, once the, it has overcorrected, it, it's kind of you know, hard to dial it back down simply by flexing the bed. Uh, so one uh, trick is to under contour the rods um, and then use reduction towers to gradually reduce the screws um, and thus the spine uh, to the rods. And obviously you have to do it gradually and, and try to do it, you know, uh, simultaneously uh, so that you don't um, risk uh, pulling out, uh, you know, uh, one screw by putting all the stresses there. So in summary, uh, multi-level inner body fusion and Smith-Peters and osteotomies um, can be achieved, uh, can achieve sagittal alignment restoration. And in our patient, we were able to obtain a 30 degree increase in lumbar lordosis and a 14 degree increase in L4 to S1. And a use of a hinge table helped facilitate sagittal deformity correction. And uh, again, it's not about how much lordosis you can achieve, but rather about hitting your target. And so that means you need to define your target preoperatively, otherwise you really don't know what you're shooting at. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. So now I'll pass the, the floor, floor on to uh, Dr. David Pauly, who will be um, giving us a recap and uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for your attention today. I hope that you've learned something from my partners, uh, Drs. Martin Jones and Sembrano.
Uh, I hope that this will enable you to help take better care of your patients and that it may help you technically execute your surgical plan just a little bit better. Thanks very much. Thank you. That is all the time we have for today. I want to thank the SPINE team from the University of Minnesota for their excellent presentation and Mizuho OSI for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.